And uh, we will now move to questions to the Minister for Education, and I call Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question one. Uh, youth provision in the South Belfast constituency is a matter for the Belfast Education and Library Board and the South Eastern Education and Library Board. The boards have advised that there are 64 registered youth providers in the area, of which 56 are voluntary and 8 are statutory providers. During November 2013, they announced that 53 schemes were successful in their applications for grant aid funding as part of my youth capital funding scheme for voluntary organisations. Five of these schemes fall within the South Belfast constituency, totalling uh, £852,000 out of an overall funding of £12 million. The successful bids were Boys Brigade, Belver Project, the Catholic Guides of Ireland Northern Region, uh, Belfast, the Fourth Spring Intercommunity Group, Rosario Youth Club and St Peter's Immaculate uh, Youth Centre. Uh, recently, I cut the first shot on a £1.4 million development of a new youth club for the Balver area, a major capital scheme in the controlled youth sector. For a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for uh, giving some of the details in relation to the answer that he gave. Uh, but would the Minister recognise, uh, and he has recognised, uh, obviously, Boys Brigade, etc. The very valuable work offered uh, by uh, other organisations such as the churches and indeed uh, the various community groups throughout, uh, and would his department encourage uh, uh, community groups uh, to fully participate in uh, the youth service provision uh, uh, from here on in? Um, I, I agree with the member in terms of all the bodies which is referred to in the provision of the youth services and indeed the document in relation to youth provision priorities for youth which was uh, launched uh, late last year recognizes the role played by uniform organization and indeed church groups in the provision of youth services uh, and i would encourage them to continue to provide what is often uh, in many areas the only provision of youth services uh, through their auspices on the use of their facilities uh, and ensuring and encouraging our young people through what is an informal setting in terms of education. So I congratulate them on the work conducted thus far. I would encourage them to continue to engage with the education boards in relation to the provision of youth service. Paul Alec Maskey for a supplement. For me, I get pretty blast kind of cool. Could I ask the Minister that the Minister having recently attended the official opening of the excellent facility, the Somalia's Youth Centre in the market area in Belfast, could the Minister outline what he would expect some of the benefits to be uh, from the opening of that centre? Well, the, the Somaliki Centre was a joint to fund project between my department and DSD, and I have to say it is uh, an impressive building, uh, both from the outside and inside, and I think it's a statement to the community that uh, government and government departments are prepared to invest in, in their well-being. The, the drive and enthusiasm which keeps uh, youth provision going, as I said to Mr Spratt, comes from the hard work often of volunteers within the community, and this is another example of where church was involved uh, in that project. I, I, I wouldn't presume to be able to tell uh, some monarchies and other organisations what work they should be in, other than what's in the Priorities for Youth programme. I think the Priorities for Youth uh, Action Plan allows communities and organisers to adopt their facilities and their work programmes to meet the needs of their communities. But given the wide range of participation of young people on the night of the opening, there's clearly a wide programme of work taking part uh, within that youth centre. Mr Michael Majimsi. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in reference uh, to youth provision and discussions we have had in the past, reference Annadale and Haywood Youth Club in South Belfast, a youth club with no premises, uh, and during the discussions with BELB, they were to provide a mobile premises. Uh, where does money come from? Uh, the uh, City Council has promised to fund 150000 to erect it. Housing executive will provide the site. Planners will provide planning permission. But still we await action from education authorities. And bearing in mind the actions that we have seen at Rosario and, and at St Malachy's, which I welcome, we have this community. Uh, and young people in this community with nowhere to go. 
Well, we clearly want to improve youth facilities uh, across all sectors. Uh, the statutory obligation for the provision of youth facilities uh, is a matter for the Belfast Education and Library Board in these circumstances. Uh, if the member wishes to write to me, I am happy to raise the matter with the board uh, and will ensure that all proper policies and protocols have been followed. But at the end of the day, the decision, from what I can take up from what the member has said to me uh, in this conversation, is that it will be a matter for the Belfast Education and Library Board. I have been securing additional funds for uh, youth services. I have secured several million pounds additional funding for youth services. I recently announced uh, considerable investment in a capital programme for youth services, and I will continue to try to secure funds both for resource and capital functions within our youth service, because I do believe them to be an integral part of our education system. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, Mr. McDimsey's question was similar to mine, but I really just want to further add uh, to Mr. McDimsey's uh, comments about the difficulties with Annadale uh, Youth Project getting funding, capital funding. Um, I did facilitate a meeting with the Belfast Education and Library Board, and it, it seems to be just they are uh, going up against Sunday. Uh, brick walls all the time, and it is a good project, Minister. It's cross community. This is project. question time. Can I remind uh, the I speaker? just wonder what, what the Minister uh, can do uh, to help this group. As your question is similar to Mr. McGimsey's question, my answer is similar to the answer I give. If the member, again, if the member would write to me in regards to the matter, I'm happy to raise the matter with the Belfast Education and Library Board. Uh, and familiarise myself further with the details around it, but it is a decision for the Belfast Education and Library Board. Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you. Question number two, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the programme director and design team for the Listen Alley Shirt Education Campus have ongoing discussions and engagement with various stakeholders involved in the programme. Work on phase one of the programme has commenced on site. This includes the provision of a new build for Arvillee School and Resource Centre. The work also includes site-wide demolition and enabling works to allow for further phased developments on the campus. Construction work in Arverley School is scheduled to commence in the autumn of this year. I recently met with representatives of Samoma High School who made clear their need for new facilities uh, which Listen Alley will provide. Further phases of development are advancing through appropriate stages and associated business cases have already been approved by government. Well, Mr Ian McRae for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Given the fact that work has begun on, on the, the first school, as the Minister has referred to, yes, um, could the Minister give the House details about the current governance and accountability mechanisms which he, he has put in place to oversee the implementation of the project? And what arrangements does he intend to put in place to ensure the governance, accountability, ownership and management of the site issues are properly dealt with? I am currently in, in the process of establishing a programme board. I am waiting for confirmation of a number of names uh, of people who I would like to sit on that board who have skills which I think would greatly uh, enhance the delivery uh, of the project. And also, in, also in terms of establishment of a board, I wish to establish a stakeholder consultation group drawn from key stakeholders who will support the bro programme board and help shape the final outcome of the Lesson Alley campus. Barry Michael Duff. Uh, can I thank the Minister for uh, the answer to his question to date? Can I suggest to the Minister that he might consider organising a public seminar, perhaps in OMA, to explain in a spirit of openness to companies, including local companies, who would be interested in the future in tendering for works associated with the Lisnelli campus? There's certainly an appetite for it in the community. People are asking questions. And I think uh, uh, an open-ended seminar explaining the procedures and protocol for everybody interested would be a good thing. I've mentioned it informally to the project director, Hazel Jones, but I'd like the minister's endorsement for it. Um, uh, I think the, the suggestion is a good suggestion, and I don't definitely with it. Um, community support uh, in around the Oman area, Oman area for the Listen Alley project has proven vital throughout the course of its delivery, and at times when there was doubts and concerns about it, it was the community support that kept the project going, so I think it's only right and proper we keep the local community fully informed 
uh, of developments and how the project will proceed going into the future. So we will make uh, arrangements for such a, a seminar to take place. Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, could the Minister tell us what reassurances his department gave to every participating school involved in the Lisinelli project so that their individual ethos would be protected? And can he give a commitment that the same assurances will be given to any new schools entering into other shared campuses? Um, shared education campuses are about bringing schools of different character. Uh, and ethos together to work with each other. I have uh, reassured, I'm not going to give any individual reassurances to schools in the sense that one school got this reassurance and another school got There was a collective reassurance given to participants in the Lisinelli project that their ethos and identity would be protected on the site. But shared education has to be about breaking down barriers and it has to be about working with each other and challenging yourself and challenging others uh, as well. I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. question three. Uh, I announced last Friday the launch of the Shared Education Campuses Programme. The Shared Education Campuses Programme will contribute towards the OFM DFM together building a united community strategy by delivering on the commitment to create 10 shared campuses. The, the programme will complement the work already underway within DE on shared education and area planning and will be targeted infrastructure projects aimed at improving or facilitating sh sharing initiatives within local schools. It has the potential to bring together a range of schools and aid sharing of classes, subjects, sports and extracurricular activities. The programme will consider projects, proposals that demonstrate that they meet the following essential criteria, number and management type of school, educational benefits, societal benefits, endorsement from respective managing authorities, evidence of parent and community, parent pupil community support, context of area planning. Priority will be given to project proposals that demonstrate that they meet the following desirable criteria, location, evidence of existing sharing. Shared education proposals meeting the criteria for the program should be submitted to the, my department before the end of March 2014, and an announcement will be made by the summer of those uh, selected to proceed in planning. And McGahan for a supplementary. I, I thank the Minister for his res response. Can I ask the Minister to outline how, how much money is available to his department to progress with such shared educational initiatives? Um, the the TBUC programme of funding uh, is a matter which is yet to be confirmed. Executive parties are working together to deliver across a wide range of policy areas announced under to towards a better united community. I, as a department, will have to ensure, well, I have no doubt, will have to make my own contributions to that from my own capital budget, but it will require executive support going into the future. We await to see which and how many projects come forward and the costings of those programmes of work before we can confirm what budget is required. But it is an executive commitment. My department has signed up to it, and I want to ensure it is delivered. Sir Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far, um, I would like to ask the Minister if he has any, had any discussions with those who are promoting the shared education um, facility uh, in Armagh, and if not, is he open to discussions with them? Um, I met the proposers of the Armagh project several months ago, and indeed I visited the proposed site for the campus uh, in Armagh City. We had a, a very good discussion. The, um, the project developers have, have work to do and I said that I would keep abreast of the developments in relation to the campus, etc. I'm reluctant to go into detail in terms of my views on it because it may be one of the projects that come forward under this scheme and I, at the end of the day, will be one of the decision makers in relation to suitable applications and I, I want to be able to Keep an open mind on all the applications that will come forward to my office. I call Mr. Roy Beggs. 
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the, the announcement and the call for application for funding. However, some schools feel uh, deeply frustrated that they have only two and a half months to put an application together, especially since such a, a length of time uh, passed since the initial announcement. Does the Minister think that this is sufficient time uh, for real engagements to occur within the schools and within the local community and to make uh, an appropriate application? Well, I, I think what we are doing here is recognising shared education projects that have been taking part for a period of time. Uh, there are many, many examples of schools out there which are involved in shared education projects and would benefit from shared facilities to move them further. And I think this project isn't about schools coming together to develop a shared education project or to begin a shared education project. This announcement is about facilitating those projects that are either at an advanced stage in terms of running over a number of years and would, and would benefit from the facility, or from the schools which have been engaging with each other over a number of years and do understand each other's requirements and therefore can submit a bid in the time frame uh, announced. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister? Um, in, in relation to shared uh, schools, can the Minister um, assure us that it won't just be a matter of, of uh, shared uh, area, but it will be more of shared classroom, uh, shared uh, learning experiences with different classrooms uh, working together rather than separate? Yeah, I, I think that is an important point, and it isn't about uh, facility A being used by school uh, B for an hour and then they move out and school C moves in. It has to be about the young people engaging with each other, sharing the facilities together, learning together and learning about each other together. That's what shared education has to be about. I call Mr. Dahi Mackay. Thank you, Mr. Cahir. Question number four. My department's ability to access EU funding is directly linked to the applicability of EU funding streams to the core business of the department. Our main focus in the period in question has been on maximising the support available from the EU's Communists and Youth in Actions programmes uh, through the British Council, which is an agency for these two programmes. The education service here has been able to benefit from a total of 4.2 million, drawn down by the Council in 10, 11, 11, 12 and 12, 13 financial years. Mr. Dahi McKay for supplementary. Thank you, I got a uh, can I ask the Minister, following on uh, from that answer, if he could detail how often uh, his officials engage with European colleagues to explore the potential for EU investment in local education projects so that we can ensure uh, that the potential from that funding stream uh, is maximised? Uh, I don't have the exact details in front of me in terms of the number of meetings that have taken place, but I can assure the Member that in recent years it has been stepped up. Uh, my Department has proactively been exploring the possibility of tracking EU structural funds in respect of the 2014-2020 funding round in order to build capacity within our pupil enhancement and enrichment intervention activities in relation to STEM, uh, technology, engineering and maths and business education. Uh, exploratory work concluded that the objectives of the European Social Fund investment for growth in jobs and program provided the best fit for DE STEM and business valuation programs. We are also exploring how uh, and which other programs under potential piece for uh, my department could benefit from. Well, Mr. Patsy McGlone. Gurma, I've got a free old ask and call you, I guess. Mugiha Slaishanaira asked in the Fregri Ganigasha. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer up to, until this point. Uh, could I ask the Minister, with reference to the EU work programme for 2014, what discussions uh, he or his department have had with Dell uh, or its officials to ensure that our young people have the right education and skill set to avail of opportunities that exist in the green economy? Um, I haven't got the exact details of meetings, etc., before me, but I can assure the member that the discussions have been taking place with the, the DFP, the Executive Office in Brussels, Dale as a managing authority for the European Social Fund, and Daddy as a managing authority for the European Regional Development Fund, in Pacific in relation to the green economy. I will forward more information to the member. I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that. Uh, 
Can the Minister inform us if he has explored any EU funding opportunities that may assist with the, the, the current projects that there are, or even new projects for shared education, uh, and those are mainly between schools? Um, we are currently exploring how my department could fit in under any Peace 4 funding, uh, and we have had discussions with a range of bodies in, in regards to that matter. I am also looking at funding from other quarters uh, in relation to shared education projects and hope to be in a position to make an announcement about that uh, in the near future. Call Mr. Joe Byrne. Question number five, Mr. Principal. Uh, my department does not recruit or employ teachers, including principals. Therefore, it does not hold information regarding the re-advertisement of posts. My officials have, however, sought this information from the relevant employing authorities. Education and library boards have advised that over the last three years, they have, on average, re-advertised approximately 10% of principal posts across the control sector and approximately 39% across the post-primary sector. CCMS has advised that in the same period, they have re-advertised approximately 4% of principal posts in the catechum and teen primary sector and approximately 11% in the post-primary sector. While these figures do not indicate that there has been a significant re-advertisement of principal posts in the primary sector, there will appear to be an issue regarding the re-advertisement of principal posts, particularly across the control sector at post-primary level. It is important to note there have been small numbers of principal posts re-advertised at post-primary level which distorts the figure somewhat. Nevertheless, I have asked management side of the Teachers Negotiating Committee, which is made up of employers' representatives, to consider this issue. I recognise that this information only relates to the controlled and Catholic maintained sector. The other sectors, voluntary grammar, grant maintained integrated and Irish medium, do not have employing authorities. To collect and collate this information would take considerable time. However, I am content to do so and provide the member with the, this information in written format in due course. Burn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Would the Minister accept that quite often now in primary schools it's quite difficult to get principals to take up the onerous job of principals? And what can be done maybe to create some sort of remedial action to try and make it more attractive, particularly for male principals of primary schools? Well, as I have said, we have, I have asked uh, um, the employment side and the management side of the Teachers Negotiation Committee to take a look at the matter in terms of ensuring that applicants are coming forward for posts once they are advertised. We also are reviewing and looking at as to how we uh, develop new leaders going into the future, how we support new leaders going into the future, and even at an earlier stage, how we identify uh, new leaders going into the future, which is a quite complex uh, issue. Being a principal is a, an onerous task, but it is also a very rewarding task. Uh, and in terms of the responsibility of ensuring the well-being, educational well-being of our young people, I think is a task which many uh, of our principals relish. Of course, it is a difficult task given the responsibilities around it. But my responsibility in this is to ensure that the resources and the capabilities to identify new leaders encourage those new leaders through and to promote and ensure that there's continuous professional development are in place and those are matters which I have currently under review and wish to um, enhance going into the future. Call Mr Mervyn Story. Question number six. Uh, my proposals on the reform of the common funding scheme have been subject of a widespread consultation with around 15,000 consultation responses received. I have previously stated that I will not be making any final decisions until a full analysis of all these consultation responses and the EQIA has been carried out. I will give careful consideration to the views of all those who have responded. Uh, the changes to the common funding scheme for schools remain on track for delivery for the new financial year and I intend to make my final decision and advise schools of their actual allocations as soon as possible. I want to ensure there is no unnecessary delay in reforming the common funding scheme and in directing additional support to those schools with the highest numbers of pupils from socially deprived backgrounds. Uh, it is unacceptable that children from socially deprived backgrounds, as indicated by free school indicators, are only half as likely to obtain five GCSEs A-star to C, including English as Maths, 
as their more affluent counterparts. I am sure members will agree this situation cannot and should not be allowed to continue. Mervyn Story for supplement. Thank the Minister for his answer. Will the Minister uh, give clarity, particularly given the widespread concerns that have been expressed about the proposals in relation to the Common Fund and Formula expressed by organisations such as the Children's Law Centre and, and many others? But will he uh, give an assurance to this House that the process will be set aside for this year and that the discussions can continue to ensure that we get a properly structured process of funding for our schools, which is based upon educational disadvantage rather than a very blunt social criteria. Um, referring to one consultation response and, and taking out selected quotes from it is not the practice I have been taking part in. I have been going through and as we have had a very uh, substantial um, review of the consultation responses, there will be a very detailed report published uh, for members and the public to pursue uh, on the way forward. I am not setting aside changes to the common funding scheme. I am moving ahead, taking into account the consultation responses, debates within this chamber, comments uh, from members and uh, bodies in relation to the common funding scheme. I believe that we can come forward with a scheme which meets the needs of our society in terms of eradicating educational underachievement because of association with poverty. I believe that the measures we have in place in terms of free school meals are robust. If others come forward in the period of head with uh, an equally robust or uh, better system, then I think that should be taken into consideration moving forward. But we have to move forward and we have to tackle this issue head on, and I intend doing that in the time ahead. And uh, I call Chris Hazard. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, can I ask the Minister, especially in light of the recent published size year 12 and 14 examination results of our uh, post-primary uh, children, if he remains committed to tackling the effects of poverty uh, in any revised common funding scheme? Uh, I do remain committed to doing so, and indeed it's worth remembering that the Public Accounts Committee, and as I've stated at the question time before, one of the most respected committees in this chamber, challenge my department to tackle head-on this issue in relation to the common funding scheme and in relation to association of poverty with educational underachievement. It is the greatest single indicator of educational uh, outcomes that there, we currently have. A child in free school means is 50 per cent less chance of achieving an education as one that is not. No member who is opposed to me using that formula has come up with an alternative version or vision of it. And I accept that the Education Committee are planning to or are involved in some work around that. The common funding scheme can be changed year on year. The mechanism is there. If, if the committee comes forward or other bodies come forward with a reliable uh, measure in relation to poverty, I will not be found wanting in using it. No one yet has, dis has um, dismissed free school means in terms of their ability to identify the individual needs of a child. Therefore, I will be using them. If others come forward with a better system, I will use them. Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Minister, Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, at this stage, all schools will have agreed a three-year financial plan with the Education Library Boards. What reassurance could you give small schools, particularly that the level of small school support will be safeguarded beyond 2014? I have already made my views known in relation to small school support when I responded to Sir Bob Salesbury's common funding scheme. It's worth noting Sir Bob wanted to remove it. It's also worth noting that there's tens of millions of pounds involved in the small school support. And it's worth noting, I think members should refresh themselves, uh, it doesn't do exactly what it says on the tin. When members would hear that there's small school support, we would imagine a small rural or a small urban school uh, with significantly no numbers of pupils. You can be funded right up until you have 350 pupils in post-primary and maybe beyond, and even in terms of the numbers involved in primary schools is quite significant as well. But I have committed to maintaining it. I believe that the matter needs further debate and further discussion. But if members seriously want to support small schools, then I think there's a duty upon us also, also to ask the question, is there a better way of doing it? And what is the definition of a small school, or what is your understanding of a small school going into the future? Uh, as well. But I have committed to do nothing until there's further work done around. Mr Jim Allister. In light of recent High Court decisions, 
Will the Minister be referring any revision of the common funding formula, given that it is undoubtedly controversial, to the Executive? I believe that uh, I have conducted myself within my ministerial obligations, within the ministerial code, and I will continue to do so. And that ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions. And the first name listed has been withdrawn. So I call Mr. Jim Wells. The, uh, the minister, uh, whilst, I don't, whilst I, I don't represent the upper band constituency, I have a very deep personal interest in the Dixon plan. And I note that on the minutes of the board meeting, of the southern board meeting of the 26th of June, it's apparent that the board took the decision that they did on Dixon under duress and then when the chief executive position became available on the southern board he parachuted one of his officials into that board to take over that position to push through the decision. What possible confidence can the community of Upper Ban have given the way he's behaved in the treatment of the Dixon plan? Um, I suspect like other members of his party he's not interested in the Dixon plan He's interested in two schools in the Dixon plan, namely Lurgan College and Portadown College. Because your local representative has no interest in the rest of the schools, so why should I suspect you have an interest in the rest of the schools? So let's be honest with each other. Your concern is the needs of two schools in the Craigavon area that serve a section of the Protestant community in that area. The less well off in Upper Ban, those from Protestant working class communities, are voiceless in this debate. No one from the DUP will speak up for them. No one from the Austrian Unionist Party will speak up for them. All concentrated on the needs of two schools who have a close relationship with a good friend of the DUP. Now, that's another matter where I think it deserves exploration. But you say that it is clear from the minutes of the SELB board meeting that they acted under duress. You didn't want to clarify what the duress was or how it is clear in the minutes, but I am aware as no doubt as your party colleagues are, that there has been actual acts of intimidation, harassment, threats made against people who have stood up and said, we don't agree with the DUP's vision on this. We don't agree with the DUP vision on this. We believe there is another way of doing this. They have been subject to threats, intimidation against them. And the DUP and the Austrian Unionist Party have remained silent on that matter. So if you want to look for duress, you want to look for intimidation, you're looking the wrong way. You need to come out and you need to be honest about what your intentions are in this area. Your interests are two schools. My interest is the education of all the young people in the control sector moving forward. In relation to your point that I jettisoned in one of my officials, I did not jettison in one of my officials. The South Eastern, uh, the Southern Education Library Board have been provided with support in the absence of a chief executive or a suitable applicant for the job. The Southern Education Library Board are perfectly entitled to at any time advertise for that post. Bills for supplementary. I can assure the member that my interest is simply not in the two grammar schools. The vast majority of my family were educated at the two junior high schools. That was their commitment to all of the Dixon scheme. And the point is, he, he keeps commenting and making scurrilous remarks about the DUP and the Ulster Unis. But those two parties represent the vast majority of people and families who attend those schools. And can also throw back in his face the view that they're so-called Protestant schools. Any child in Craig Avenue area is entitled to attend either Lurgan Junior High or Lurgan College. There is no discrimination, unlike the other sectors within Craig Avon, which are purely for Roman Catholics. What confidence can the people of Upper Ban have in him, particularly when he represents the area, when he's trying to railroad this through against the wishes of the vast majority of parents in Upper Ban? The member states that he and his party represent the vast majority of the unionist community in Upper Ban, and he's absolutely right. But then start representing the vast majority of the people in Upper Ban in relation to this matter. Because your voices have remained silent on the educational and poor educational outcomes afforded to the Protestant working class in that community. You need to stand up, you need to make your voices heard and say the current status quo is completely and totally unacceptable. And I note the member avoided the points I made to him 
about the intimidation and the threats being made against those who prepared to stand up and say something different from what his party is saying and the Austrian Unionist Party is saying. He chose to ignore that fact. Now, you have serious questions to ask yourselves in relation to where you want to see education going in the future. And can the people of Aberfan have faith in me? I have no proposal in front of me to make a decision on. The Southern Education and Library Board need to publish a proposal in relation to the future direction of education in the controlled sector. There is no proposal published. If and when a proposal is published, I will allow that uh, proposal to be fully debated. I will receive uh, representations from all who wish to speak to me, and I will make my decision based on the educational well-being of all the young people in the control sector, not just a few. I members that uh, no one should be pointing at uh, other members and remarks should be passed through the chair. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I wonder could uh, the minister outline the key findings of the recent OECD report and our education system here? Uh, I welcome the fact that the OECD have now reported. We are bringing together educationists on Friday for the OECD themselves to come and make a presentation on that report and then open it up to a, a, a debate on the way forward, which I think will be a very useful uh, engagement. The OECD report contains a wide range of findings across a range of areas, including 41 strengths inherent in our current evaluation and assessment arrangements, as well as 30 specific challenges. The report suggests 33 policy options which includes 15 recommendations. I have tasked my officials to reflect on the report as part of the ongoing developments of my policies here. I will not make a formal response to the report until following uh, Friday's discussions uh, with educationists uh, and further consideration of the report. But I think the OECD um, intervention and report will prove beneficial for our education system for many years to come. Jean for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I wonder, uh, does the Minister have any plans to follow up with the OECD on this piece of work? Well, I don't think such programmes of work should be a one-off. Um, as I said, the OECD are coming back to engage uh, with our educationists and indeed further with my department. But I would like to see a rolling programme of work with, with organisations such as OECD because we, we, we subject our schools to inspection, we subject uh, a variety of areas in our society to inspection. I think it's useful to bring out, and our, 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 our debate in education at times can be very insular, it can be very uh, narrow and focused um, sometimes on the needs of the few, but also it, it, it fails to break out of, of the narrow barriers of the North uh, and learn from other experiences. So I think the OECD allows us to examine our education system and our, our, our the strengths and weaknesses in our education system on the international perspective, rather than sometimes the narrow debate that we have in our society. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister's statement this morning announced that uh, there would be an increase in enrolment figures for Priory College. Thank you for that. Uh, has the, uh, the Minister any plans to increase enrolment figures for other North Down schools which are continually oversubscribed? I have no authority uh, to increase or to increase the numbers of the school on a long-term basis. It's, up, it's a matter for the, Southern Edu or the, the board to publish a development proposal if they believe that a school's numbers should be increased in the long term. I can make uh, increases in, in year if there is a specific demand on a school. I can make increases then, but I believe the best way for it, if there is a recognition that a school is facing um, continuing demand higher than it can deliver, then I think the best way forward is for a development proposal to be published and for that mechanism to be gone through. Leslie Cree for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. I would have thought that uh, he would have taken a much more active interest in that because it's been going on for many, many years. Um, particularly, Minister, the schools in Bangor East uh, are very popular and they achieve good results. Uh, bearing in mind the RPA, situation now where we'll be, have a different hinterland altogether. Does that not encourage the Minister to have a look and try and take some action to resolve these problems? Well, it's not a case that the Minister have not taken an interest in the matter. I have established area planning. I have tasked the boards uh, as the managing authorities and indeed CCMS to come forward with area plans in regards to post-primary and primary school provision. 
uh, and that's how we should map out our sustainable schools going into the future. Uh, if the member has specific issues in relation to schools in the area, I would advise him firstly to raise them with the board uh, and, and ask the board to see if the demand continues or, or meets what they have outlined in their area plan. But it's, I haven't um, avoided the issue. I'm putting in place mechanisms to deal with this in the long term. If there's a short term issue, then there is a mechanism to deal with that as well. I call Mr. William Humphrey. The, the Minister will be aware of the issue of educational underattainment in the Greater Shankland, indeed across uh, working class areas of Belfast. He will also be aware of the manifesto for education for Greater Shankland presented to him by my colleague Nigel Dodds, MP. Can I ask the Minister for what progress has been made on that particular project? I had a meeting with uh, Mr Dodds just before Christmas. Uh, we had further discussions in relation to the Shankill Manifesto and their um, appeal for an education action zone to be declared uh, in that area. I have tasked my officials to investigate the matter further. I had discussions only yesterday uh, with my officials in relation to this matter. I am exploring it further to see what benefits, educational benefits there would be in me declaring such a zone and what actual real impact it would have uh, in the area. Or is there other ways of achieving the same goal which the manifesto sets out? Mr. Humphrey for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. Can I assure the Minister that it, having met with uh, met, uh, the principals of uh, post primary and, and uh, primary schools uh, before Christmas, that the view with those uh, group of people is that something needs to be done. It's a view of the community, it's a view of, of governors, and I speak as a governor of two schools, it's a view of parents. And really, something has to be done to address this issue, not just across the Greater Shankill, but across the city of Belfast and working class areas. And can I ask the Minister, can he put a time scale and some resource into delivering uh, for those communities uh, and uh, tackling and addressing this issue that's been long running for some many, many years? Well, it's worth noting the common funding scheme which I'm proposing will put significant amounts of additional money into the very schools you're talking about, but yet not you oppose it. Now, you can't have it both ways. You can't seek additional resources. Then when I put a mechanism in to put additional resources in, turn around and say, no, we don't want you to do that. I have identified how we can achieve additional resources going into the very schools you talk about. But in terms of uh, the action plan, declaring an action plan or, or uh, educational action zone does not in any way mean that there's, there's no longer responsibility within the schools or within the Board of Governors or within the principal's office. No, I'm not suggesting you are saying that. I'm telling you what my views on the matter are as you requested me to do so. So, there's a responsibility. Well, you asked me a question, so you must be seeking some view from me. So it is. The, the way this process works is I don't get to decide what questions you ask me, and you don't decide how I answer them. It's a very democratic process. So it is. Uh, you know, and that's how the dam when you stand behind one of these boxes, you'll decide how to answer questions, okay? <laughs> if you ever stand behind one of these boxes. Uh, the responsibility rests with the schools and the Board of Governors. And there is challenges within the schools, as has been recently found out in relation to the inspection reports in the area. And the, the formal intervention process will have to be followed through, whether we declare an education action zone or not. The work which is going on by the Greater Shankill Partnership is in fact an action zone because they are dealing with the socio-economic issues in relation out in the community and trying to improve people's lives that way. And if you improve the socio-economic background of someone, you'll also improve their educational outcomes as well. The Greater West Belfast Partnership is also drawing down funding in relation to uh, education matters. And I have encouraged the Shankill Partnership to further engage with the West Belfast, West Belfast Partnership in relation to that. But in short, I'm not going to make a decision simply to make a decision on it. I will call an education action zone if I believe that it is going to have benefits for the young people it serves. I'm not going to call it for the sake of calling it. Uh, just to point out that uh, speaking from a sedentary position, having presented your question, really only victimises other members who are waiting to get, answer, to get asking questions. I call mm -hmm. Michael Majimsey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, this morning, the Minister made a statement in which he talked about schools being at the heart of a community. Newton Breda High School is just such a, a, a school. It has the full support of families, pupils and staff uh, and is looking to go forward. It's ahead of your enrolment numbers. It's successful, yet you have decided to close it. Can you explain that, please? 
Well, I have decided to close it under a technicality. It is reopening again under a new guise. And it is a school which will reopen as a new school with, in partnership and serving the entire community of that area. Our education system cannot be built on the needs of institutions. It has to be built on the needs of pupils. I believe the decision I made this morning was the correct decision. The amalgamation of Newton Breda and Knock Breda is the, is the right way forward for serving that community uh, now and going into the future. If I had not taken action and, uh, now, you quite possibly would have seen the loss completely of, of Knock Breda, and no one knows what, how sustainable Newton Breda would have been going into the future. We now have a sustainable school going forward with high hopes for the future. That concludes question time. Sorry, let me finish. Uh, time is up. We will now be uh, returning to the consideration stage of the Public Service Pensions Bill. Point of order. Come to you. Um, during his answer to Mr. Wells, Minister O'Dowd claimed knowledge of instances of threat and intimidation. Uh, threat and intimidation, of course, involves criminality. Would it be in order to ask if, with that knowledge, the Minister has reported such matters to the PSNI, as might be expected from his public role and his obligation to uphold the rule of law and not to withhold information? In addressing the circumstances of this uh, session of our Assembly, I think the Member has strayed well off the, uh, the point and I do not accept that as a valid point of order. However, I will refer this to the Speaker's office uh, because there was also an allegation made of coercion from this side of the, uh, the House, which wasn't substantiated, and I think that should be examined. Point of order. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Principal Speaker, and this follows on from the point made in relation to the comments in regards to the Education Minister. Will you refer this matter to the Speaker? Because the comments by the Minister were inaccurate in relation to his representation of my party in regards to its interest for all the schools in the Craigavon area, and that was totally in fact you know, and untrue. And secondly, I want the issue to be referred so that the re references made to intimidation can be investigated by the police and that the Minister is questioned on what he knows and that that issue is resolved so that we know the truth rather than what I have to say are very regrettable comments made by the Minister in this House today. Uh, my view is that that's not a valid point of order. It's not for the Speaker to decide what is the Minister's opinion on any particular set of circumstances. However, I have already indicated that uh, I will ask the uh, Speaker's office to uh, refer to the, uh, the Hansard report of this session uh, for them to uh, decide whether or not there are any issues that need uh, response. The point of order, um, to be fair, having listened to what the Minister said, the Minister did not express his opinion. He made an allegation, which I think is somewhat stronger than making, making simply an opinion across the chamber. He made an allegation of intimidation. Sorry. It's, I mean, I'm sure that the member doesn't wish to challenge the chair's authority to decide on this. My view, my view is that it is not for the Speaker's office to determine what the Minister's opinion should be.